Now I come to my last point uh, of the discussion. The last point I advance here is to link the permanent economic crisis together with climate change, resource scarcity, wars, and political conflict. We know that there are long-running political conflicts that come from resource scarcity and a decreasing ability to operate agriculture in troubled regions like Sub-Saharan Africa. We know that the most war-torn region happens to be in the Middle East, and it is hard to find a day where we don't read about nasty killings and explosions in countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Not surprisingly, we have seen a huge refugee wave, which has resulted in intense political discussions in Europe, but hard to halt the stream of refugees. The political optics of the situation cannot be uglier. At a time of massive austerity, people in Europe are being told that they should tolerate refugees who inevitably need clothing and shelter, financed by the state, which creates a perception of injustice. In Austria, the government wants to shield the labor market from the refugees because there's a, the old tradition of prioritizing employment for citizens, especially when the unemployment rate is high. But if the refugees are not allowed to work, then they will burden the welfare budgets, though I doubt that the burden is quite as heavy as the right-wing policymakers claim. But the optics is what matters in politics. Extreme right-wing forces are very much in the rise, and we only need to look at the recent elections in France, you know, with Front National uh, and Poland with the Party of Law and Justice, um, to see that you know, this is the case. Germany and Austria also have tremendous right-wing potential, even though a Nazi history makes those attempts still rather muted. The FPO in Austria could gain much more power, and so does the AFD in Germany. And let us not forget Donald Trump in the US, of course, which is another right-wing example. These are political forces which still speak in the language of a democratic polity. But substantially, they would, know, they would see no problem if a charismatic ruler were to put in place his policies with few or no constitutional restrictions. Whether it is banning the building of mosques or ridding the country of immigrants, these political objectives, as absurd as they might sound, they are somewhat popular among the frightened masses, and they would require quite dictatorial means to carry out. The losers are the defenders of civil liberty and democracy. Well, some people say that my fears of an enlarging authoritarianism are overblown, and that from a world historical perspective, we never had so much freedom uh, to disseminate our views so cheaply and so widely, like, for example, you know, when I publish my blog. But my view is that we already see indications of government clampdowns on civil liberties. The famous examples of Edward Snowden, who revealed Homeland Security data, and Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, the major platform to reveal government secrets. What happened to these two gentlemen? Well, Snowden today is hiding in asylum in Russia because you know, you know, he published a material um, to, um, from the U.S. government and he happened to not offend the Russians who are now at crosshair with the West anyway over Ukraine and Syria. Assange is hiding in the Ecuadorian embassy in London even though he's facing extradition to Sweden for trumped-up sexual harassment charges, which are then in turn linked to the U.S. desire to have him extradited to the U.S. to face prosecution. Snowden and Assange are the heroes who show that the emperor wears no clothes and they're prosecuted by the U.S. government. Well, one could argue now that few of us are as heroic as these two gentlemen and that we commoners live a normal life without a permanent uh, prosecution from our governments. But we need to think twice here. What Snowden and Assange have shown the world is that government surveillance is a major industry which is growing by leaps and bounds. Every time there's another terrorist attack, whether it is 9-11 in New York or the Paris attacks recently, there's a new justification for each government to step up the wiretapping of phones, emails, bank accounts, and other digital information portals. The government tells us that in order to protect national security, it is necessary for all of us to give up some of our privacy because we don't want to risk another terrorist attack, right? Well, how ridiculous this argument is. If the government were serious in preventing future terrorist attacks, they would attempt all they can to stop adding fuel to conflicts in the Middle East. They would give the youngsters in their own countries real job and educational opportunities 
rather than let them lie idle and become receptive to extremist influences of any stripe. So if we know that the government's not really interested in preserving national security, why is this expensive security apparatus to monitor the population necessary in the first place? Well, Lu Guoquant noted in his research that the reason why more Americans are put into prison and why more Europeans face welfare retrenchment and workfare activation schemes is that these measures are a way to manage social insecurity in a neoliberal political economy. This makes perfect sense. We don't have anything productive to do for the working masses, so we increase monitoring over them. Because things will have to go wrong, right? Under communism, everyone was roughly equally poor, so the crime rate was negligible. In a flourishing capitalist society, crime rates are somewhat higher because you know, there will be crimes of envy, but we don't expect that much crime because everyone has a reasonably good life. In decadent capitalist society, we expect even more crime because the poor need to steal to survive. Well, ironically, the historical crime data cannot even bear out this hypothesis. Steven Pinker noted in his research that historically, you know, today uh, we are less violent than we used to be because of the civilizing force of the central state, literacy, education, and commerce. Well, I've not engaged his thesis deeply enough to question it, but I will note that as a new liberal political economy has taken hold, people are not tending toward more crime, yet the penal state thinks that we have to be prevented from getting crazy ideas via constant surveillance. Well, part of the effort of surveillance comes from the technical capacity to do so. You know, it is harder to intercept the content of letters or face-to-face -face conversations than, say, phone calls or emails. Another part comes from managing simply the social insecurity uh, of the neoliberal political economy rather than taking steps to s solve the root of the problem. Governments tend to say that all safety measures are taken to prevent terrorist activity. But if we look at the various police clampdowns from the Seattle uh, WTO protests, the Arab Spring, to Occupy Wall Street, to Ferguson, Missouri, and lately Paris after the terrorist attacks. We can see that it is the goal of the states to maintain social order, or social disorder, to be more precise. We may consider the police batons and the tear gas as attempts to preserve the social disorder of the status quo. Yes, neoliberalism is bad for health, bad for the environment, bad for our wallets, but it is better for us to shut up and accept it than to rock the boat. In conclusion, it appears that while democracy is a worthwhile social endeavor, which humans have worked very hard to accomplish, it is difficult to imagine how it can be sustained over the long term, given the external challenges that we're facing. Democracy, as I see it, is a luxury good and not a basic pillar of life. In the past, we did not have many forms of democracy anyways, as the ruling classes throughout history have convinced us that in a world where life is solitary, poor, brutish, nasty, and short, we cannot afford the luxury of democratic polity. We were being told that we need to unite behind a leader who in peace times ensures that the grain storage works the way it should, and in times of war, ensures that we unite against a common foreign enemy. Even if we were not sympathetic to these notions, we lacked the literacy and education to question this paradigm. All of that appears to be a joke to us today. And given the rise of right-wing populists and demagogues in the developed world, the conjuring up of real and imagined enemies like ISIS, the building up of a surveillance state, the permanent austerity and economic crisis, the resource constraint, the climate catastrophe, and the refugee wave, among many other issues. We can no longer say with the same confidence that democracy can weather the storm ahead. In times of crisis, the demand for a strong man who promises easy solutions to complex problems will overpower the voices of reason. Democracy will be considered a nuisance because it is too slow or too inflexible to respond to grave crises with the urgency that is required. The Roman Republic drifted into the Principate. The French Revolution drifted into Napoleon's monarchy. 
the Russian and Chinese revolutions drifted into the dictatorship over the proletariat, and the German Weimar Republic drifted into Nazi dictatorship. We know that history usually does not repeat itself, but it does recur, recur with certain patterns beyond our choosing. 